This gold telluride, known as calaverite, was named in the 1860s for California's Calaveras County, a place made famous by Mark Twain's first published story about the celebrated jumping frog. It's also a county with some very large trees. A gold telluride is a mineral in which gold is atomically bound with an element called tellurium. There are a few different gold tellurides, and I've been discussing one of them, sylvanite, in a few earlier videos. The others include krennerite, petzite, and montbrayite. There are only two ways that gold and tellurium incorporate as a pair, and I find these two compounds interesting because they express ratios we see in music. Calaverite is the octave with a 2 to 1 ratio of tellurium to gold, and montbrayite is the perfect fifth with a ratio of 3 to 2 of tellurium to gold. Comparing these two, whose only difference is the tellurium to gold ratio, it's odd that one of them cleaves and one does not. And the fact that calaverite doesn't cleave in twain makes sense because the octave is perceived in its entirety. It's two over one, the power of two. It doubles. But it's the perfect fifth that halves or cleaves the octave. So it's only Montbrayite, the perfect fifth, that cleaves. Cleaving in twain was a common phrase in medieval times that meant cutting in two. The word brings us back to Mark Twain, who adopted his pen name after hearing a ship's hand marking the water depth at two fathoms. I suppose we should take him at his word, but I tend to think of the concept of twain more specifically as two things that were originally one thing, but are now separated. This act of separation is very similar to dissolution. In marriage, this means divorcing a couple that, when married, were considered one. So the phrase Mark Twain has this strong sub-meaning in my mind, referring to something that's been disincorporated, as in the metallurgical dissolution of a gold telluride. Calaveras County is also well known for its gold mines. Twain himself mined for gold there. But in Twain's story set in Calaveras County, the only metal he mentions is the lead shot poured into the celebrated jumping frog to weigh it down. This story was actually commissioned by Twain's friend Bret Hart in his office at the San Francisco Mint. Today, the Bret Hart Union High School stands in Angels Camp, California, so it's somewhat odd that he'd write a story set in a gold camp he knew, but make lead the focus. I really wonder what kind of metals-based conversation Bret Hart and Mark Twain were having at the Mint when this particular story was envisioned. It's almost like he was substituting lead for gold. But we'll come back to that. In both calaverite and montbrayite, tellurium occupies a larger percentage of the compound, and it's the presence of tellurium that designates them as tellurides. We're told the name tellurium comes from the Latin root tellus, meaning land or earth. But naming a mineral for the earth seems a little vague. The act of naming a mineral is done to highlight distinguishing features, not to call attention to the fact that the mineral resides in the earth. Surely then all minerals should be named for the earth. But the story goes that uranium was named for the god of the sky, and so tellurium was named in contrast to that. Perhaps, but spelling tellus with one L gives us the more relevant meaning of weapon, which is very similar to the Latin root tellum, meaning sword. This is relevant to tellurium because it's often described as bladed. Tellum may have evolved from a similar Greek root, meaning a stake in the earth. Again, relevant to the bladed nature of tellurium. 
which presents us with a clever metaphor. If gold is bound within a stone by the bladed element of tellurium, then in order to release the gold, you must remove the blade of tellurium from the stone. The very metaphor of King Arthur, who removes a sword blade from a stone. Today, if we want to release the gold from calaverite, it's dissolved in sulfuric acid, a seminal act of alchemy, because after removing the telluric sword from the stone, we're left with pure gold. The name Excalibur takes us even further down this rabbit hole. It derives from this Welsh word that I can't pronounce, which is a compound of caled, meaning hard, and belch, meaning breach or cleft, so that Excalibur means from a hard or stony cleave. I wondered if the cal prefix of caliber and this Welsh word could also be related to calaverite, calaveris, or even California. The prefix cal does etymologically refer to mining, but only in relation to tungsten or wolfram ore, not to any tellurides. But I wasn't ready to give up on this line of inquiry. What we're told is that calaverite, calaveris county, and the calaveris river were all named for the Native American skulls found in that location of California based on a Spanish-Latin derivation of the root word calva. But I rarely accept what I'm told at face value, and calva is not the same root as calive. If we use that root instead, we get another Latin word meaning, again, sword. And there's reason to be intrigued by the prefix cal or calif. In the linguistic exchange historically occurring between Germanic languages, especially the Scandinavian with the Saxon, the letters of B and V were often interchanged. There's even a name for it, Beticism. And the same thing occurs with the letters V and F. So the Calib of Excalibur is very closely related linguistically to Calib, as is the Caliph of California. I suspect someone knew long ago that the sword of a bladed element was chemically wedded to gold in this part of the world. So we have both tellurium and calaverite, referring back to Latin words meaning sword. Which brings us around again to Mark Twain and his treatment of Excalibur in his 1889 novel, A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court. Arthur was said to have acquired Excalibur in two different ways, one that involves Arthur pulling the blade from an anvil or stone, another where it's handed to him by the lady in the lake. Twain's Connecticut Yankee novel uses the latter method and the arm Twain describes as protruding from the lake is wearing white samite, also known as cloth of gold. I talk about the meaning of cloth of gold in my review of Stanley Kubrick's movie, The Shining, as cloth of gold symbolizes the act of smuggling gold, obscuring its value as bullion and instead producing it as gold thread or wire woven through cloth. Twain's description of the Samite sleeve could be suggesting that the sword, tellurium, is wielded by an arm clothed in gold as a symbolic representation of tellurium's ability to obscure gold, and that would fit, as tellurium certainly does change gold's appearance enough that this telluride isn't easily identifiable as gold ore. Twain's Connecticut Yankee is a jack-of-all-trades named Hank Morgan, a soul who transmigrates from the 1800s back to 6th century England. In Arthur's court, Hank Morgan's knowledge of telephone wiring and placard advertising is perceived as magical, putting him on par with Merlin himself, and he's given a cloth of gold to wear. My raiment was of silks and velvets and cloth of gold, and by consequence was very showy, also uncomfortable. But habit would soon reconcile me to my clothes, I was aware of that. 
The word habit means a form of dress, and our modern understanding of a repeated action becoming a habit is suggestive of how people dressed in various uniforms can be entrained to perform the duties of that uniform mindlessly. With Morgan's new cloth of gold uniform, the task of obfuscating gold is now laid upon him, and, true to his new task, we see him begin to debase the money of King Arthur's realm. Morgan recounts his first debasement of the currency in chapter 26, ordering that some of the money from the treasury be inflated into five-cent nickels, a nickel to take the place of each gold coin. Yes, this is satire, but Morgan is the hero of this tale, modernizing the ignorant folk he encounters in Arthur's court. People he describes as modified savages and intellectual moles. These aren't farcical or satirical attempts at modernization. They're all straight out of the 19th century progressive playbook. After establishing the media, Morgan begins his overhaul of Camelot by opening a patent office and instituting a few layers of governmental bureaucracy. This novel reads like the tale of a progressive reset, in which Hank Morgan is sent through a time slip to blow up a few castles, then set up training academies and trade unions in their place, topping off his efforts with advertising campaigns in which knights ride around promoting soap. Yes, this is satire, but an inflationist, consumerist Morgan is the hero of this tale. If he weren't, the novel would stop being funny. In Morgan's next debasement of the currency, Twain revisits his story about the frog weighed down with shot and fully actualizes the idea of substituting lead for gold. Using shot for money was a good thing for the government the metal cost nothing, and the money couldn't be counterfeited, for I was the only person in the kingdom who knew how to manage a shot tower. This was back when shot was formed into a sphere by dropping it from a height. So not only was Morgan in charge of monetary inflation, he also monopolized its production. More than a few historians and literary critics have told us that Twain supported the gold standard, but that's unlikely, given that he was clearly a progressive. The novel Twain wrote with Charles Dudley Warner, The Gilded Age, served as the late 19th century metaphor of the superficiality of gold, a common theme covered in progressive magazines of the time, including The Atlantic. In fact, The Atlantic and The New Republic were the two most outspoken magazines against the gold standard. Twain published many stories in The Atlantic, listed here, mostly while his best friend, the progressive socialist William Dean Howells, was the magazine's editor. Twain's next-door neighbor, Harriet Beecher Stowe, was a co-founder of The Atlantic. And Twain's friends can tell us a lot about his political and monetary views. He was a close friend to one of the central figures quietly promoting a central bank, John D. Rockefeller and Twain's finances were personally handled by Henry Huddleston Rogers, a colleague of Rockefeller's who invented the modern-day oil pipeline. Twain was enmeshed in a group of progressives who hoped to remove the gold-backed dollar and institute the petrodollar, something that only took them a century. Progressives were well known for opposing the gold standard, and in my book, The Next Octave, I lay out an entire chapter showing progressive arguments against the gold standard. Reports of Twain's support for a gold standard have likely been a misunderstanding of his support for bimetallism. And there's a lot of evidence that he supported the bimetallist movement called Free Silver. A big one is his main character's last name of Morgan, likely a hat tip to the Morgan silver dollar first minted a decade before Twain's novel was published. Twain didn't overtly write about his own views on monetary policy, but we can gather his position from various clues. When he pretended to run for president in 1879, he wrote that he wasn't in favor of either rag or hard money, 
which leaves only one option left, bimetallism, also known as free silver, the unlimited coinage of silver. Because it would be unlimited, such a policy would produce inflation of the money supply. At the time, the U.S. had moved from bimetallism to a gold-only standard. This prevented both silver, which existed in large amounts, and paper money, which could exist in an almost infinite amount, from being inflated. Twain's brother had campaigned hard for Abraham Lincoln's bid for the presidency and was rewarded by Lincoln with the position of Secretary of the Nevada Territory in 1861. Twain accompanied his brother to Nevada as a sort of assistant. Lincoln was the first president to pay for a war, in this case the Civil War, by printing money, called greenbacks, that you could not redeem at any bank for gold or silver. So we know his brother had supported a candidate that instituted and inflated a fiat currency. Yet another clue, Twain was the vice president of the Anti-Imperialist League, a group that endorsed William Jennings Bryan for president in 1896. Bryan was a very vocal advocate of free silver, who strongly opposed the gold standard. His cross of gold speech reads very much like the progressive City of Gold article that appeared in Blackwoods in 1864, suggesting we abandon gold and use credit, a blatant call for debt-based currency. And that very same year, 1864, a newspaper editorial ran in the San Francisco Daily Morning Call that's believed to have been written by Mark Twain, as he often wrote such editorials for this paper. At this point, greenbacks had been in circulation for just two years to fund the Civil War, and they were not backed by gold or silver. By July of 1864, the value of a greenback had fallen pretty drastically, and the following month, the editorial began by saying, The era of our prosperity is about to dawn on us. The editorial goes on to describe a dimly lit meeting of the cabal, in which it's presumed they're planning the demise of the fiat greenback dollar. This bit of satire pilloried the men supporting hard money by depicting them as secretive fat cats. Whoever wrote this editorial, likely Mark Twain, may have supported ending the greenbacks, but did not support hard money or the men discussing it. 1864 was also the year that Nevada became a state, and its legislature appointed William Stewart to the U.S. Senate. Stewart was a miner and then a mining lawyer in both California and Nevada. By 1867, three years into Stewart's first Senate term, Mark Twain was working for him. At the time, he and Twain were both Republicans, but Stewart left the party 20 years later to join the newly formed Silver Party further evidence that Twain was surrounding himself with, and even working for, advocates of free silver. Lead, as an abundant metal that's worth little, could be satirical stand-in for silver, especially since using silver itself would have been much too obvious and not at all satirical or funny. Is this why Twain, a gold miner himself, replaces gold with lead in two of his published works? Or does he? Mark Twain may have been saying one thing in the lines of his work and another thing between those lines. In Chapter 18 of The Connecticut Yankee, when Hank visits Morgan Le Fay at home, he compares the conscience of a man to the very item in which Excalibur was embedded. An anvil. And then Hank suggests metallurgically dissolving it with acid. This take on the Arthurian legend wouldn't require any brute force to remove the sword from the stone. It would require only chemicals. And what happens when you dissolve the stone with acid? If it's a gold telluride, like calaverite, in Calaveras County, you remove the sword of tellurium and you're left with gold. But this message wasn't for everybody. Gold was only for those few with well-connected friends. The ignorant masses of any time period could get by with lead. 
Maybe now we're starting to better understand Twain's extremely literate and quietly amused audience. Twain used the word dissolve nine times in the novel, six of which referred to enchantments, spells, and magic, the alchemy of the sixth century. His first use of the word goes like this, let the enchantment dissolve and pass harmless away. It sounds a bit like Bacon's funeral monument dictum, let the compounds be dissolved. But would Twain have even been familiar with this quote? Absolutely he would, as Mark Twain was a Baconian himself. He wrote an entire section of his own autobiography devoted to the argument that Francis Bacon wrote the works of Shakespeare. Twain was also a member of the Freemasons, a fraternal order Francis Bacon reorganized in the early 17th century as speculative Freemasonry to reflect the ideals of Rosicrucian and Solomonic philosophy. Samuel Clemens, as he was known before his pen name of Mark Twain, was initiated into Freemasonry in 1861 at the Polar Star Lodge in St. Louis. And this may explain why Twain was such a strong advocate of Bacon's with regard to the Shakespeare authorship question. How much did Twain really understand about the gold tellurides in Calaveras County? Was he possibly aware that large aromatic trees are often found in proximity to them? Was he maybe even familiar with the Rosicrucian legend in which cedar trees direct Christian Rosenkreutz to the location of a chemical wedding? Again, we're left with only hints. But Twain did collect a piece of cedar while visiting Lebanon and had his piece of cedar made into a gavel for his Masonic lodge back home. Please join us in Silveritas to continue this conversation. The link is in the description. I'm grateful for any feedback. Please leave your thoughts in the comments, and thank you for watching.